Welcome everybody to this session of uh, Darbar's Me Too in Indian Classical Music and Dance. That's sexual abuse in Indian Classical Music and Dance. We have audiences joining us from India, the UK, where this is being broadcast from, and many other parts of the world. Um, uh, following on from the allegations of sexual harassment by young women, and it was mostly women, uh, in India and the United States against some senior Indian classical musicians, Darbar believed that this year's Women in Music session, uh, which is an annual feature of Darbar actually, um, should focus on this particular subject. We're delighted that we have a very distinguished and vocal panel to discuss uh, these matters with us. The session will last for 90 minutes. Uh, we have an hour for the main session. Uh, and you'll hear from all our panelists at that time, but please keep sending us your questions because there is a question and answer session of about half an hour at the end. Uh, the bars team will be collating the questions and putting them to me and I'll put them to the panelists at the end. Um, if you have any questions, please add them into Facebook comments on the Darbar Facebook live stream. Okay, our panelists uh, today are Swarna Rajagopalan, who's in Chennai. She's a political scientist by training. Recently, her work has centered largely on issues relating to women, peace, and security. She also writes on politics and now runs a nonprofit research center, Pragnya Initiatives for Peace, Justice, and Security. Uh, Swarnaji, can you tell us a bit about Pragnya's work? We began uh, thinking that we needed to create awareness around gender violence simply because people would behave like it wasn't a problem anymore. And uh, that's really where you begin to change by getting people to acknowledge the problem. Part of that work has included working on workplace sexual harassment with corporates, with students, um, really anyone who will listen to get them to talk about what the issue is, what the legal options are, and how workplace safety is actually a fundamental right so thank you and uh, sangeetha shivakumar is a karnatic musician educator and social and cultural activist she's also part of saha which is a group working to help survivors of sexual abuse uh, she's also the wife of tm krishna who we will come to in a minute uh, can you tell us a bit more about saha's work Uh, basically, soon after the Me Too allegations came out in 2018 in the Carnatic music uh, field, uh, I was observing all the responses and reactions which came out on social media and based on the small conversations, that very, very minimal conversations that we were having among, amongst us, I realized that some a very important point which struck me was that the total lack of awareness of this, that sexual harassment, what, what, is, what it's all about. And there is no safe space for even young musicians to talk about it freely. So we just thought that some like-minded musicians like me got together, many youngsters based mainly, and we formed this group called Saha, meaning along with, where we thought we will uh, provide a safe space for conversations and also facilitate more conversations, uh, thereby creating awareness, raising awareness on this topic, which is, I think, the most imperative now today. 
talking more about that soon. Um, TM Krishna is also in Chennai. He's a Karnataka vocalist, writer, activist, and author. And in terms of the activism, it's said he challenges tradition and cultural privilege. Can you tell us briefly what that means? Oh, I do something very simple. I just try asking difficult questions about myself and the environment around me. Uh, that's all I do. And uh, I just hope uh, that by asking difficult questions and making myself vulnerable and people around me vulnerable to those questions, um, we can raise some reflection, some interactions and some crossovers and learnings. That's all. And we've got Devina Dutt in Mumbai. Uh, she's uh, an arts writer, translator, editor, and curator. She's also the co-founder and artistic, artistic director of uh, First Edition Arts. Um, can you tell us a bit about First Edition Arts, uh, Devina? Yes, Charu. Um, First Edition Arts is a performing arts company based in Mumbai. And we promote and organize and document in film uh, classical concerts, Hindustani and Carnatic, usually in alternate spaces in different cities like Kolkata, Chennai, Mumbai, Pune, etc. So uh, increasingly, we hope to move to expand into other art forms as well. That's great. Um, we were meant to have Shubha Mudgal, who is a senior vocalist, author and columnist. But unfortunately, she's in a place uh, in a very remote area with uh, no internet connection. But what she has done and how she is joining us is that she sent us videos uh, of her views on this subject. And uh, we play them out during the session. Um, Sandeep Birdi is with us in London. Uh, he's the founder and artistic director of Darbar. Sandeep was born in Kenya, where he began learning how to play the tabla from his father, Bhai Gurmeet Singh Birdi. They moved to Britain in 1975, um, and Sandeep, when he was still a student, uh, uh, set up Tal, Rhythm, the Rhythms of India, which was established to promote uh, tabla solos, uh, and leading tabla uh, soloists have, have uh, performed there. Um, unfortunately, in 2005, Sandeep's father died rather suddenly, and that's how Darbar was born. Sandeep, can you tell us a bit about uh, Darbar? Yeah, sure. Uh, as an, we're a UK-based uh, charity, uh, we promote uh, Indian classical music and dance, and we have three streams of work that we deliver. One is uh, our live events, we have an education project, and uh, we do quite a lot of uh, digital work uh, with uh, both television and social media. And as an organization, uh, whilst I'm the face of the organization and you see uh, me standing on the stages and blah, blah, blah. I have a, a board of trustees who I am answerable to and I work with a very small but very dedicated team uh, who support the work of uh, their bar. And you've received an OBE, an Order of the British Empire from the Queen for your services to the promotion of Indian musical heritage in the UK. Um, um, so congratulations on that. Um, and I am Charu Shahane. Uh, my day job is as a senior journalist in the newsroom uh, at the BBC World Service. Uh, and I was a Darbar trustee uh, once upon a time. Now, uh, the subject of uh, this discussion, violence against women and girls, uh, we know that it's a global phenomenon. It's an umbrella term uh, and it uh, covers, you know, many types of abuse, uh, physical, sexual, psychosocial, uh, economic, um, and sexual harassment. Um, and the majority of allegations in the classical music world uh, have been about sexual harassment. Um, so I just thought it would be useful to have uh, some definitions. Um, one of them, sexual harassment, is inappropriate touching, inappropriate comments, sexual jokes, sharing sexual photos or messages, putting up sexualized images, paintings, or posters in a workplace or place of education. Uh, it affects women everywhere. One in three, that are the statistics, women experience violence in their lifetimes. Um, 
And uh, although uh, in India, the statistics are extremely concerning, women are sexually harassed every 15 minutes, it said. Um, but this is uh, clearly not an Indian issue. Uh, in 2017, one of the most high profile and revered, uh, I would say, conductors in uh, Western classical music, James uh, Levine, he was a conductor at the Metropolitan Orchestra, uh, Opera in New York. He was sacked because of similar allegations by men playing in the orchestra. Um, James Levine sued the Met um, for defamation, but the matter was settled out of court uh, with him receiving a payment of three and a half million dollars. Um, and I mention that because uh, it's an example of the sort of trajectory that some of these cases can take. Um, and we'll uh, go on to discuss uh, that later. Um, here in Britain, 70% um, of students and musicians in classical music have said that at some point uh, they were harassed and uh, the majority of those cases were sexual harassment. Um, so I'd like to ask the question um, to Sangeeta first. Um, in India, the Me Too movement seems to have started in uh, Indian classical music in the South, in the Carnatic music world. Um, can you briefly tell us what those allegations were? In 2018, I think late 2018, a uh, lot of uh, anonymous, uh, of course, they were not, uh, they, they, they were not, uh, we didn't know the uh, actual uh, victims, but they, there were a lot of anonymous uh, allegations which came out. But it was, uh, I think, Chinmayi and a couple of other people, they got all the information and uh, through social media and they put it out on social media that uh, it was mainly a uh, lot of. Uh, uh, teachers and you know students the relationship between a student and a teacher problems there so it is based based on those uh, kind of settings and uh, that's how the whole social media was bu a buzz with this and it was quite shocking for the whole Carnatic music community and then there were perpetrators that were named so we knew the names of the perpetrators but we uh, sadly because the system doesn't allow for a support for the victims the victims were not able to come out boldly and reveal who they were so this was the background. And I think Krishna can uh, contribute more to this uh, because he was be quite involved in the, from the beginning, right? Yes, yeah, sure. I was going to ask um, Krishna ji as well as uh, uh, Swarna. Um, these are allegations. Uh, as uh, I am aware, nobody has actually been convicted. Um, but I understand that the Sabhas did uh, take um, note of this. Uh, can you tell us what happened then? Yeah, I think, uh, as Sangeeta said, these were allegations that came out through social media, through uh, people telling friends and telling people they trusted that this is what had happened to them. And as Sangeeta pointed out, the main space which we realized this was happening was in the teacher and student relationship in the classroom environment. There were a few cases of something happening backstage, but majority of the uh, accusations came from the space which is between the teacher and student. Now, what did the organizations or the sabhas that uh, impresarios that organize concerts do? Um, there were two sets of reactions. Uh, the Music Academy Madras, which is a premier organization, did their own inquiry and just banned this, this set of musicians from performing on their stages. There's another group of organizations called the Federation of Sabahs. And I would say they began on a positive note when they said they will form a collective ICC that would investigate uh, these accusations and create an environment for these uh, women to come out. Unfortunately, uh, this was completely uh, a non-starter because there were many mistakes including, I think, I would believe that the intentions were not there to really find uh, a step forward because on the committee of the ICC was an artist who had close relationships with one of the accused, uh, who had also made public statements which were mildly put wishy-washy. Uh, the ICC, created over the last two years, it's 2018, we are in 2020, not one email has been sent to musicians about the ICC. No one knows how it functions. We do not, there has not been one workshop. 
there has not been any initiative to create a safe environment for survivors so i think this has been basically uh, a facade that give us give us the illusion of action being taken but honestly and bluntly put nothing has happened and, and to make it worse many of the alleged perpetrators are have been featured in this year's online december music festival so um i am not an optimist at this point of time uh we have to note at this stage that uh, the allegations have been denied and um you know nobody has been convicted of it um swar uh, swarna ji uh, what what do you think is the reason that you know uh, something that which gains momentum the allegations are taken seriously the sabhas do uh, say the, the sabhas are uh, for those who don't know are uh, have quite a lot of power in uh, the carnatic music world because they um they uh, uh, so called, they put on performances and they allow people to perform so um so they did take note for a while um why did it all fall through what do you think is the reason well, i think this is a good example of why you need to set up the processes before there's a problem because exposed factor sub uh, committees like the one that krishna described it essentially um window dressing you need it's not just having a committee or even just having a policy you have to have an institutional sign off an investment in getting things right and having a better workplace or a better performance space um a better performance culture arts culture and for that you needed to have these conversations when there were no specific allegations uh, you know prevent pension is always better when these allegations came out there was there was a hurried attempt to put these solutions together to appear as if you are resolving the problem so i agree with krishna there a little has been done we are here we are in this space and we have not heard of anyone doing workshops or trainings until this year which i have to say you know began with devina's festival in chennai in february and through the year i've been talking to and working with musicians young musicians senior musicians here on this issue so i think something is shifting where it needs to shift on the ground but where are the institutional structures that can take an allegation into due process they simply do not exist and one of the other challenges is that sometimes the you know the law has certain strictures right due process also protects those against whom allegations are made in the interests of natural justice so if there is a a considerable amount of time if the allegations are anonymous it's really up to even follow due process and come to a conclusion so there are two sides to this and uh, the bigger side definitely is that um, uh, you know an exposed factor response is pretty useless thank you um so for a while um we we heard about these allegations from the carnatic music world but not very much from the uh, hindustani music uh, in the northern that's the northern tradition and people wondered you know why this was uh, is it that hindustani music was you know somehow uh, quite clean it's a question that i asked uh, shubha mudgal who sent us uh, this response and this is what she had to say it would be hypocritical on my part to even suggest that the problem of sexual abuse and uh, sexual misconduct has not touched the world of hindustani classical music it has been around for a long long time but it's only talked about in whispers and very rarely do people come out and call out predators um when that happens there's usually a, a bit of gossip and scandal for a short while but no real discussion on how to solve the issue and how to deal with the issue or how to support um survivors and victims um but it has been around for a long time in fact all the problems that beset society in general um can also be found in the world of hindustani classical music so if there's a parochialism casteism exploitation sexual abuse sexual misconduct that is rampant in society it's not possible that it would not touch the world of hindustani classical music and this uh, sort of hallowed space would remain completely untouched by these issues 
Um, Davinaji, so, you know, just when we thought it was pretty strange that there were no public allegations of sexual harassment in Hindustani classical music world, along come, uh, you know, a slew of allegations against senior figures in the Drupad Sanstan. It's important to say again that they were strenuously denied uh, by the accused individual and nobody has been arrested, let alone uh, convicted of a crime. Uh, can you tell us the latest on that? What's happened there? Well, yes, I think uh, when allegations surfaced for the first time a couple of months ago at the Drupad Sansthan in Bhopal, the sheer, uh, you know, the, the numbers of uh, victims, survivors who came forward wanting to share their stories. And it all begins on social media because, you know, that gives you some kind of safety in the absence of a real safe uh, space. Um, so, those, those, uh, I, I feel that um, the way that this case has developed um, is largely also due to the fact that these allegations surfaced during the times of COVID, when the live music scene was in limbo, and uh, the digital, uh, uh, you know, the digital scene, the digital uh, exchange of uh, concerts, etc., the platforms were sort of on the up. And this gives a certain degree of increased anonymity. It also um, challenges and disrupts some of the traditional hierarchies, some of the traditional power structures. It also empowers a whole lot of people simultaneously. And that is why um, uh, these uh, allegations came up in such big numbers and they refused to go away. They, they, you know, the initially there were defensive uh, statements issued and uh, but it didn't go away also because earlier when there were allegations made they were usually by a lone victim it's always easier to uh, you know intimidate and uh, frighten off a lone victim in this case there were uh, there were many uh, survivors there was also having sp personally spoken to some of the um, survivors i can tell you that the sheer depth of depravity of some of the uh, accounts being shared it just made it very very difficult to go away and uh, although everything was uh, attempted by uh, those who were uh, accused of these allegations um, and the fact that students came together the community there was at least some sense of a community forming online i think that brought attention to this and uh, uh, currently, uh, the ICC report, uh, the investigations are going on. The ICC report apparently is, is to be ready uh, very soon. And we'll see how, how uh, that uh, tends. But then, as I you know, also it. recently, one of the accused... Yeah. I, I understand that, um, you know, th there was a, sort of a basic error in even the ICC, which was that, uh, uh, you know, one of the brothers of the accused was um, on the panel of the ICC, of the internal complaints. We talk about the ICC, we're talking about an in internal complaints uh, mechanism. Um, and uh, there were those kind of errors, which, um, to my understanding, um, is what leads to women being very reluctant to uh, to come up with uh, allegations and to try and pursue uh, uh, pursue a case. Um, and um, I talked to Shubha Mudkal about this. She was talking about the barriers that women face coming forward uh, with their allegations. Uh, let's hear from Shubha Mudkal again. One doesn't hear too much about cases of sexual abuse and misconduct in Hindustani classical music, perhaps for a variety of reasons. Uh, one, of course, is the fact that we seem to be losing faith in the systems that were meant to um, keep such problems under check. Uh, for example, proceeding with a legal um, case, um, filing a complaint, proceeding with a case against um, the person who is abused. Um, all of that takes way too long it could be decades um, and you don't know whether you will get justice uh, the system has also been known uh, to be open to being manipulated by uh, the more advantaged and powerful so people feel that that option is not really available to them other than that uh, victims when they do uh, come out and talk about such issues 
very often we've seen that they've almost been looked at with suspicion and with a sense of, uh, you know, blaming them for um, bringing disgrace to this hallowed world of Hindustani classical music. I've heard a lot of people say, for example, that why talk about it now after so many years or what do they hope to achieve? Some people even believe that there could have been a, a consensual relationship which turns sour and that's why um, now there is a complaint. Um, so all of this, you know, this kind of um, blaming of victims, um, the fact that uh, legal systems, it is believed, will not stand in good stead. All of this, I think, finally uh, makes people feel that there really is no point in making a complaint and coming out in the public with a complaint because it's just for a short while that there is some discussion about it and after that uh, everything proceeds as if um, nothing had ever happened. So I think there's a sense of disappointment and of being let down by any systems that could have been in place. Um, TM Krishna, you wanted to say something um, in response to what Devina was saying. Well, I have two things to say, actually. Uh, I'm not going to call uh, having absolutely the wrong person on an ICC panel a mistake. I think many times mm -hmm. these are part of the design to make them ineffective. So I'm going to be a little blunt about that. Secondly, I, uh, Swarna can correct me if I'm wrong. This I'm responding to Shubha's uh, comment about the legal mechanism. I think it's important we discuss the civil society social mechanism because sexual harassment is one of those areas where uh, it's not about going to the police station and going to, uh, say, an advocate. So that is why we need a social civil society mechanism. And I think uh, we need to create trust in that mechanism. Because this is, uh, even if it's a rape case, you know what happens in a police station. And in the gray area of uh, sexual harassment, it is far more problematic. So I think trust in a civil society mechanism is very, very important. Um, I wanted to um, uh, come back to you about something. Um, you know, uh, one of the things, of course, uh, mo you know, this panel could have been made up entirely of women, but it was quite important to have you and Sandeep there because, you know, um, uh, although allegations, uh, f first of all, most of the allegations are made by women against men, but, but women need male allies. Uh, and I understand that you have been using your, your um, you know, your celebrity to try and do something about it. You're also an activist, but you're also a celebrity. Um, and I understand you did that uh, recently with the Drupad Sansthan case. You tweeted, if I remember correctly, uh, to say that uh, one of the accused was being given a platform on the Tansain Festival, at the Tansain Festival. Um, what, what happened as a result of that? Okay. I'm not going to take credit for that. Um, it's a bit... Uh, too um, ego egoistic to think that you made that uh, impact. Nevertheless, I think it was uh, it was quite a, a ridiculous situation where um, you know one of the accused from the Dupasta Sansan with many accusations that have come uh, out and with an ICC committee which has not yet come to a conclusion was being featured in a Tansain uh, Samaro in Gwalior which came under the state government of Madhya Pradesh. And uh, I just felt that this is deeply problematic. And I want to say one very important aspect of allowing such people to share so much public space is also that they are, it is a show of power on their behalf. Look, look, I know so many people. Look who I know. You can't touch me. So what, what messages are we sending the survivors and those who are vulnerable? And therefore, I just put out a tweet. Uh, I understand many other people in social media also put a lot of pressure on uh, the organization. And I am glad that uh, at this very crucial juncture, when uh, we are also going to hear from the ICC, he is not playing in that festival. Um, again, we have to say that he's uh, denied the allegations. So um, it, it brings me on to um, another point, uh, which is, um, 
you know, should the artist be separated from the alleged predator? Yeah, go on, go on, Swarnaji, yes. I just wanted to distinguish between on, um, the various processes. The first is the one that Shubham Mudgal referred to, which is the courts, the police law, which takes a very long time. But the civil process, the ICC in-house process, there is actually a 90-day limit also for the complaint. Once the complaint is accepted, it has to be heard and the report has to be filed within 90 days. Of course, sometimes committees take longer, but that is... Um, that is some sort of uh, check on that endless process. You can stack the committee in your favor, all of that. All that is true. The third is a civil society sort of process. And I'm not sure, I'm less optimistic than Krishna on that because I think, you know, where is the authority, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a different discussion. I just wanted to clarify that the ICC process is different from the endless court process. Um, are things particularly bad in India? I was wondering because, um, you know, I alluded at the start to lots of allegations in the Western world, but is it something about uh, the way um, Indian classical music is taught, um, say the Guru Shishya tradition, uh, where a student often lives in the house of the teacher? Uh, does that tradition make it uh, particularly bad? Sangeeta Ji, I'd like to bring you in here. Yes. Uh in fact, I also wanted to add to a little to what Krishna and Swarna said earlier, which is also connected to this point. The, I think the very important thing that sure. all, all of us must realize as this, uh, as part of this community, as the Carnatic music, um, we all belong to this Carnatic music ecosystem. The very important point is that we are, it's an unprofessional space. It's not like a workplace where, so even if you have allegations of sexual harassment, I think as you all know, if, you, if, they, if, if it's an office or a corporate, or I, again, Swarna will... Uh, have more uh, details to give on this point but there is a system in uh, place there are actual procedures where you can you know you can the perpetrator can be punished in the, in the right way and there's a you know committee to see it and all that but in this the whole the carnatic music ecosystem is such an unprofessional space and all of us can't deny the fact that the larger problem of the extreme patriarchy and uh, the misogyny and the you know all the, that plays a huge role in in these uh, problems of sexual harassment so uh, so coming back to the guru shishya parampara it's a it's a very complicated uh, situation uh, uh, in, in today's world the uh, students don't necessarily live with the gurus like in the earlier days but having said that they do spend a lot of time at the guru's house so where you know a, a, a girl comes to learn from a uh, uh, established musician and uh, you know she comes with so much of awe for the person and you know uh, she's uh, so much of respect for the person uh, for the uh, for the guru and uh, initially they are coming from very far away you know because they've heard of her you see, it's literally like your idol that you see on your screens and on your you go see on your on the stage and then you actually end up going to that person and learning from him and then you become part of that family part of that household you're hanging there most of the time. And uh, that is where I think it is so important that the guru should not abuse his position of power. And that is where all the mistakes happen, which is really sad. And again, there, the victim has nowhere to go because it's a confused uh, state of emotions for the victim where she's, uh, she's actually in awe of the person. She's, she's given uh, her whole life is about you know, learning from that uh, the guru and trying to get, uh, if you're a serious student of music, you want to become big in the field. And you, so it's so important that you have to play the uh, play along with the powerful people there. So it's, it's extremely complicated. And this is where the gurus end up exploiting uh, the situation, which is really, really shocking and sad to see. And again, as I said, an extremely uh, unprofessional TV. space. So how do, you, how do you deal with it? Well, TM Krishna, you've actually um, suggested something quite radical, which is to abolish the Guru Shishya tradition. Can you tell us why? I mean, if just break that down a little bit, because if we take our emotions out of it, you know, what is this that we treasure about this system, you know, uh, or is it even a system? You know, we keep talking about Guru Shishya Parampara. Um, so, you know, if you take the, the myths, uh, take the emotional 
uh, aspects and also take personal examples out of it. I have had a wonderful relationship with my teacher. Does that mean the Guru Shishya Parampara operates? No. So any uh, system cannot be weighed or cannot function based on the quality of the individual within that system. The system must be such that it, 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 it protects and it functions in a fair and just manner, even if there are, shall we say, horrible people within. That's one. Two, what is so special about it? Are you telling me, telling me that wonderful learning does not happen across the globe, does not happen in so many other forms of art, where people are not spending seven hours in the guru's house and vulnerable to exploitation? I mean, who are we kidding, honestly, very bluntly speaking? So, you know, great aspects of learning exist across the globe. There is an emotional bond between the teacher and the student, the mentor and the mentee. But that's a living reality across the world. That is not unique to the Guru Shishya Parampara. The non-verbal communication of learning is not unique. The after-hour discussions are not unique. So what really is unique? It's actually nothing. So therefore, if you look at it, the system is unfortunately a complete basket of unequal power and abuse. This is a world where contacts matter. This is a very small environment. One whisper it carries from one end of Bombay to the other end of Kolkata. That's the world we live in. And if you're a, a young girl learning from this master and not just learning music, but you want to get opportunities, like Sangeeta said, it's networking. You're completely at, I mean, at their beck and call. What protection does that individual have? What, does they, what recourse do they have? So, you know, I think if you are really, if you want to really be modern people, and I'm using modern in a very, very uh, sensitive manner, people of today, there is actually nothing so special about the Guru Shisha Parampara that's unique only to it that we have to really hug and kiss. Well, that's one uh, fairly radical solution. We will be coming to solutions uh, later. I want to remind uh, people who are listening that they can send in their questions uh, to the panelists, uh, either to the whole panel or to individuals, uh, individual panelists. Um, and we've started getting uh, lots of comments. Um, let me just read out a few of, few of them. Uh, so there are commentators in South Africa and India who've uh, expressed the importance of this debate and uh, said there should be a united stand against uh, perpetrators of violence. Uh, several people have also talked about the need to address sexual harassment beyond music, but also dance. And certainly the title of this was in the Indian classical music tradition. Uh, this is not to say that it's not happening in dance. Um, of course it is. Um, uh, Jagdeep uh, Shah has said it's a very old issue. Many senior artists are known uh, to have been involved in, in, in uh, issues like this, but all behind closed doors and it has been swept under the carpet. Um, and Neera Bhakt says the sad part is uh, this has been going on for generations to a point where sometimes we are conditioned if not even realized that we've been harassed. Um, so which does, you know, take me to what can be done about it. And I, I am looking for solutions because I, I don't think that uh, we can just have endless discussions about it without discussing how uh, spaces can be made uh, safer for women and men, how the classical Indian uh, music industry can can be made safer. Uh, it's a question I asked Shubha Mudgal actually, and she made a number of interesting points. Let's hear her. I really don't have any ready solutions to offer. I think for um, any solution to actually um, slowly be put in place, first we will all have to acknowledge the fact that there is a problem that exists. If we choose to brush it under the carpet every time um, someone comes out in the open, then I guess we are denying the fact that there is any problem and that these are just uh, occasional, you know, rare cases. I think unless we understand that, yes, there is a problem, uh, we will not even try and look for a solution. But apart from that, I think, you know, for example, in recent times, there have been cases where institutions have been involved, institutions that teach music, 
Now in India, there are uh, rules um, and guidelines um, regarding um, issues of uh, sexual misconduct. I think the Vishakha guidelines have been around for a long time. I think now is the time when somebody should um, check whether institutions that teach music uh, have um, ICCs, uh, complaint committees in place as recommended by the Vishakha guidelines. Um, now, naturally, this is not something that an individual like me can do. I do not have the authority to go to music institutions and say, uh, are your uh, ICCs in place or not? This will have to be done by people in a position of authority. I think it is high time we uh, started asking for these um, uh, guidelines to be adhered to and for somebody to audit whether or not they are in place in the many, many institutions that are teaching music, including Hindustani music. Apart from that, I feel that organizations, you know, will also have to take a stand. Um, I can only take a stand personally and, let's say, condemn an incident like this. But, you know, what happens is that very often organizations choose to partner with individuals who have been accused. Uh, can they not uh, say that till such time as these allegations are cleared, uh, we will not partner with the, or we will not invite um, such an individual who is accused of uh, sexual abuse. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Their lives, their concert careers or their careers as people advising government, etc. All of this goes on as if nothing had happened. So I think organizations will also have to take a stand. Are we going to celebrate individuals with an extraordinary gift? Um, the person who is accused may have been a wonderful musician or may be a wonderful musician. Are we going to say that the life and the music of an individual are divorced from each other and therefore we can continue to invite them for concerts, can con continue to celebrate the work that they have done in the field of music and completely ignore this. I think it's high time we took a decision and organizations take a stand on whether or not uh, they would like to partner and continue working with individuals like this at least till the time, till such time as they are cleared of these allegations. I'd also like to say that I'm a citizen of a country where in parliament there are people who are accused of heinous crimes against women. We have elected them to power and they are the people who are governing our country. Why do we allow such things to happen on the basis of, um, of, of uh, uh, a kind of a excuse that they have not been convicted? If you keep on doing this, if you keep on saying that till such time as the allegations are proved correct, correct they, they cannot uh, be removed from um, office. I think uh, this is giving them a chance to continue their lives and for victims to feel unsafe uh, for the rest of their lives because the, pro the legal process takes a long time and that means you can actually spend a life um, in public, in service, without anything ever disturbing you at all. We'll have to rethink this. Um, I'll come back. I'll pick up on some of the points that um, Shubha Mutgal has said, uh, but I'd just uh, like to read out a few more comments. Um, uh, there are a lot of comment commentators actually disagreeing with dismantling the Guru Shishya system. Um, many have said that their experience has been very positive. Um, and uh, there's uh, uh, Margaret or Margaret uh, Flavia Trumper from uh, the US, I think. I'm a Westerner, Westerner and learn in the Indian Guru Shishya Parampara and I see a lot of difference. I think she means in her, in her music, uh, but that might be specific to my personal experience. Um, and, uh, but just to pick up on what uh, Shubha Mudgal said on the last poll, uh, on one of the points that she made, should the, actually should the artist be separated from the alleged perpetrator, per, alleged predator, perpetrator, because, you know, they've produced absolutely stunning body of work. Are we just going to bury that body of work, pretend it never happened? 
expunge it from the records. Uh, I mean, it's it's uh, it's a question for Swarna as well as for uh, Sandeep, who's got a lot of online concerts by people who have been accused. So first to you, Swarna, and then I'll ask Sandeep as well. The first would be, I think in principle, if someone brilliant has been accused of sexual harassment as an activist, as an advocate, as a feminist, I would say absolutely, you know, while we're waiting for due process or whatever is going to follow, I would want people to say, you, you know, we will not host you, we will not listen to you. As a fan, I think the question becomes much more complicated because, um, and I, I, I put this out there as an admission because I think that when you admire someone's work, it becomes also a part of who you are. It defines you in some way. So how, how does each of us then work on that separation? No more will I buy their CDs. No more will I go to their concerts. So it's not just the organizers and these and sabas. It's also the person consuming the art, I think. And that makes it a very complicated question. But um, do artists who are teachers have to adhere to a higher order of moral behavior, I think like all teachers, they do. So I think that that's a really roundabout non-answer to your question. Um, since we're talking about solutions, I'll let me read out a few comments again before I come to you, Sandeep. Um, there's a proposed solution from a US-based organization, the Indo-American Association in Houston. It says our organization in Houston moved away from hosting <coughs> artists in homes and place them in hotels because of sexual harassment of hostesses. That's quite something. And uh, uh, the same organization says, excuse me, if we hear about uh, the reputation of certain artists, we do not enter or promote such artists. Sandeep, uh, you're a promoter. <coughs> excuse my voice. Uh, what would you do? I mean, it's uh, it's very simple. Uh, if someone uh, has been, there is an allegation against someone who has uh, misbehaved, uh, harassment or sexual abuse, it's very simple. We do, do not invite them to perform at the Durbar festival. Um, we also uh, would not do that until the, the case has been cleared. But what I would say is that this stuff isn't very easy and then what we do have is a board and we discuss the stuff with with the board and we've been bringing up issues surrounding women within the festival uh for a, for a very long time um but coming back to your thing we do operate like we were people were saying that what are the solutions for this we do actually operate a block list if we know that someone has been accused for harassment we will not invite them. If we know through reliable sources that this person has this behavior, we will not invite them. Um, if we find out that someone has performed at the festival and subsequently we find out information about them, uh, we will not uh, bring them to the festival. Um, and this is even if they have not been convicted. I mean, uh, what about the principle of uh, innocent until proven guilty? I'll ask the question of Davina, because she is a promoter as well. How do you deal with the you know, principle of somebody being innocent until they're proven guilty? Well, obviously, Charu, on paper, we all want to abide by that principle in every aspect of our lives. But since I live and work in India, and a huge gap that exists between those who are powerful, those who are protected, those who invariably get away with all kinds of things, and survivors, victims, vulnerable students, on the other hand, I know that we are living and working in a in an environment where their systems are not in place, laws are not enforced. There's just a lot, a lot that's missing here, a lot of missing gaps. So even at the risk of, I mean, I would do my due diligence, I would do my, I would try to find out, is this an established uh, pattern of behavior? One would talk to a few people, but I, I would stick my neck out to say that I would uh, avoid working with 
the person irrespective of whether charges have been brought or not because that's where the question lies the whole problem is that those who are vulnerable are not able to in this current system make those charges and as an organizer i'm also a civil society member so i feel that i have uh, uh, you know a commitment and a responsibility to to question this system which lets big stars big musicians get away with it for decades we all know about it and uh, so i would even at the risk of later being proven wrong in which case i'm happy to apologize uh, i would keep them off my ramming list completely unambiguously there's no question about that as i understand it here in the in the west uh, and darbar for example uh, needs uh, artists to sign a contract uh, so there's some uh, sort of institutional framework with which they operate uh, which uh, which implies that you know uh, since there's a legal document uh, the space might be a, a bit safer so i want to ask the question to uh, uh, sangeeta um should a guru's um, home where they teach uh, or a school you know maybe even the space under a tree if they're teaching there be regarded as a sort of a workplace um, or will that kill creativity <clears throat> sorry i i didn't understand your question sir uh, charu so so there's you know the uh, the the whole guru shishya tradition is quite informal should should the whole system be institutionalized in some way should there be and you know a body which oversees it uh, should the space where a guru teaches a student should that be considered a workplace and therefore uh you know subject to uh the regulations that apply in a workplace or do you think that might uh kill creativity okay um so i i i will give you a practical answer to it because uh, having been in this field for more than 30 years as an artist as a practicing musician and also as a teacher i think theoretically what you say sounds good like even what krishna was saying that you know do away with the guru shishya parampara and all that um but having said that this whole concept of institutionalization for example it is not i, I think all of us will agree that the whole uh, uh, this whole uh, issue itself is so layered and complicated and uh, there is no like a magic solution to these things right so theoretically yes i am for some kind of a uh you know an institu institutionalization or where you can have some kind of set rules so that the teacher you know uh, there there are some the teacher and the students are bound by certain uh, basic rules where no nobody steps the over, oversteps the lines but practically we have to see how to take these forward because i think that is the huge challenge for all of us right so in fact that is what i uh, if i can just add, uh, continue and talk about uh, the the small discussion that we have been having through a group saha because uh, from the last two years after the me too allegations came into the uh, picture the the thing that really struck me it, it hit me hard in the face was the total lack of awareness of even a, what do you mean by sexual harassment for example so even when i was talking to my male colleagues and i'm talking about the younger generation forget even the older generation so i'm talking about youngsters who are doing so well today and you know uh, and even the top musicians i'm very sorry to say that none of the top artists in the in our field have also been able to come openly and even say that you know this is so wrong or even engage with this issue in a little more serious manner so i i, I realize there's such a lack of uh, engagement lack of awareness and i think we have to have multi pronged approaches so we can we can start with conversations which also aid and abet these things so maybe in the long run we can look at some kind of institutionalization that's what i would say Okay, so uh, Swarna, you wanted to comment on that, I believe. Yeah, yeah go on. Swarna, legally, uh, whether a guru is teaching music at home or in an institution, um, it's a workplace, right? The guru is doing her work or his work, and the student is doing their work. So it is a workplace under Indian law. So you know, all of those 
uh, strictures would and, apply. And, uh, and there are, for people who are not part of institutions, there is a mechanism available at the district level where they can take a complaint. So it's there. Does it work? Not so well. Okay. Um, uh, Zabina, uh, in our previous conversations, you mentioned um, the possibility of a sort of an overarching representative body, um, which mm. uh, were you suggesting that that might have a sort of a policing job uh, to keep the industry safe? Uh, what, what, do you, what did you mean by that? No, I mean, I just think that, uh, you know, it's a paradox, but uh, the classical worlds, whether Hindustani or Karnataka, are really very tiny spaces, but they're so divided. I'm speaking now about the Hindustani systems, which I've seen clearly. There's a trust deficit among stakeholders. There's no question of discussing, representing, uh, you know, having open discussions on any issues. There's one party painting the other in horrible colors. The other will respond. I mean, it's just so, so futile and such a waste. So I just felt that we need to acknowledge that we need a space where we can come together, different uh, members of the ecosystem, and discuss some issues. We don't even have that. Everything is a whisper and a gossip in there. So how on earth are you going to build any kind of consensus, any kind of serious analysis of what needs to be done, what is wrong? And when will people begin to see that it's in our large interest to come together and address urgent issues? I mean, audiences in classical music aren't exactly growing by leaps and bounds. You don't want this, this ecosystem to get a worse name. You want it to also get in other listeners from other walks of life, other art forms. It's not happening at the rate at which it needs to. Why? Because, because there are some things that are lacking within us as stakeholders, as members of this ecosystem. And unless we find spaces, whether it's, I'm not very much in favor of one large overarching body, but maybe smaller cluster, smaller federated uh, you know, uh, uh, organizations which can then come together, just just uh, use the cooperative society as a model, maybe. I don't know. But look at these things seriously. Talk, discuss without fear and without pressure. And only then can we even raise these issues. I don't see that happening. Um, what uh, has been done, uh, Swarnaji, in, uh, in the area of making the industry safer so far in India? Uh, because the entertainment, uh, let me just tell you where I'm coming from. The, the entertainment industry in the US, as I understand it, has contracts and now a morals clause is in the contract, uh, which sort of prohibits the artist from behavior, which uh, defames uh, the company. But uh, you know, this is uh, where you have orchestras and so on. Uh, can you explain what's being done in this uh, field in India, or in uh, you know, in, just to make the safe, uh, to make the space safer? I'm afraid we've lost you again. Um, your your sound has gone again. Uh, let me just read a few more comments. So let me do that first, and I'll come back to you. The Indo-American Indo Association from Houston again says um, you can't expect organizations like the bar to become the judges in a public court. Uh, Sarah Day says uh, one must also consider whether it's safe to condemn an artist bef before the justice system has finally concluded its investigation. Um, and we'll come to questions in precisely uh, two minutes. Um, so, uh, Swarnaji, you were saying, yeah. I think that Sangeeta and Krishna are better placed to talk about what is being done by the Sabhas and so on. Um, I'm not. But I am seeing people look for solutions much more than they were one year ago. And that's a good thing that the solutions that I'm seeing are like Saha, uh, places where conversations are being facilitated and encouraged. Because unless you start talking about the issues, you're not going to resolve them. You know, we have a bad habit of looking for legal institution solutions and they matter. They matter a great deal, but they remain in isolation unless people around them are willing to use the solutions that are, that are presented to them.
So that's an important thing. I've also been working with a group of uh, young artists from North America who set up something called care spaces and they're looking at a peer support network um, they don't have helpline yet but i think info at carespaces.org will get to them um, they're looking to talk to young people who find themselves in these situations i think we need to be talking about we've been i've been hearing the word ecosystem through this conversation what is that ecosystem that ecosystem is all of us as well so uh, and shivam udkar made a very good point about how we vote people into power who have been uh, accused of uh, sexual crimes what is our tolerance level as a society you know people commit sexual harassment because they think they can get away with it it's an it's an exhibition of their power in a particular situation so what is our uh, as a society are we willing to say this is enough we don't want you to do this anymore or are we just infinitely compassionate because of their greatness and because of our inferiority and because of our obligation and all these other things our culture um so really i think i come down full circle to really who we are and what we decide to do every member of the community not just sabas not just laws not just you know artists but everyone needs to be having this conversation and i see that happening now more than i did one year ago and thanks largely to people in this group where we're going to begin questions now the first one is to utm krishna but uh, before i ask that question i just want to pick up uh, on something with uh, uh, sandeep again uh, sandeep you have got uh, a bank of music uh, concerts that were given by people who now have serious allegations against them are you going to remove that and are you going to make them unavailable to the public i think that's a that's a good question it's a difficult question to answer right now uh, but it is something that we are reviewing with our board um on uh, what the next steps will be uh, but i would like to just bring in uh, this it's a it's a complicated debate uh, probably needs another session uh, about the art that uh, artists create and then what happens after you find out uh, whether they have been uh, responsible for harassment or sexual abuse so um, it's not a simple case of just yes or no uh, i think there's also the implication that if you have a recording of someone I'll give a, a slightly silly example of if someone is playing tanpura with someone and they've been accused of sexual abuse and you take down that video the main artist and the accompanying artist will suffer from that I'm just giving you an example that these things are not straightforward um also I think uh there is something that uh, uh people can do is actually just to stop listening to those recordings but I want to bring the subject outside of the indian classical domain if you look at the global issues you've got some really really big stuff going on like r kelly he he remains in prison for uh the history of alleged alleged uh, sexual abuse and his trial will begin in september 21 however spotify removed his content but spotify is a platform for sharing other people's content the actual people who own that content have not removed it now the same is for example john lennon who has admitted that he beat up and psychologically abused women and he was part of the beatles now it is possible for you to go and get the beatles stuff it's not been taken down michael jackson was accused of molesting underage boys as elvis presley's wife was just 14 when he started pursuing her david bowie had sex with a 15 year old etc etc so these things aren't as simple as just you take it down or not uh, i've been looking at museums who've got pieces of art really of national significance and some feel that they are going to take it down some feel that they're going to leave it there but what they're going to do is they're going to disclose all the information so then it's the people who are viewing that content that they can make a, a decision on it in terms of what can be done we need to be looking at reporting how can we create an atmosphere and a system of reporting how do we make the industry safer i think there's a role for the sangeet natak academy and the iccr they are the government bodies of arts in india 
major festivals like Savai, Saptak, the Music Academy in Chennai need to be hosting more sessions like this one. The bar is not there as uh, we are, this is this session is not about us judging people. All it's doing is making it awareness, creating awareness for this uh, subject matter. I think there can be training on sexual violence courses uh, uh, and harassment that people can go and attend. In Durbar, we have uh, to follow both Charity Commission and Arts Council guidelines. So we have developed over the years a zero tolerance policy. We have a, a behavioral code of conduct that we uh, adhere to. We have a safeguarding policy. We have a whistleblowing policy. We also have risk assessment. And I think this is really critical for any organization that is holding events. So we will do a, conduct a sexual harassment risk assessment and create an action plan to reduce risks. For example, uh, women taking flights, women taking airport transfers, women staying in hotels, dressing rooms, meals, all of this is monitored with a very detailed thing. I would also like to add that in India, you have corporates who give money to the organizers. They are bent backwards on the whole concept of the living legend, that without the living legend, they cannot sell out their events. They must only give money to organizations that have a zero tolerance policy, a code of conduct, safeguarding and whistleblowing. So I think there's a number of things that can be done. I think cultural change isn't something that can happen very, very simply. We've already said right at the beginning, one in three women will, will face harassment or sexual abuse in their lifetime, and that's a global statistic. So changing the hearts and minds of individuals is difficult, but it's not impossible. What we have to do is take bite-sized steps to take it forward. I'm glad I didn't stop you speaking, Sandeep. <laughs> Um, that was very useful uh, because it's actually a checklist of everything organizations can do. And that's that's really useful. That's really helpful. Um, uh, there's a question to you, uh, TM Krishna. Uh, when you talk about, it's from Ragini Pasricha. She says, when you talk about civic social mechanisms, can you say a bit more about uh, what you have in mind? Because trial on social media can be very dodgy. Uh, no, I was not talking about trial on social media. I think we did talk about it. I think Swarna did about uh, the ICC, uh, the possibility of every org. In fact, the condition that every organization needs to have an internal uh, committee that looks looks uh, for cases like this, which people can come to if they have been harassed in any manner. There's also the idea that uh, Devina also suggested, could we have a collective clusters of such organizations, say city-based or art form based? So these are the uh, mechanisms I'm talking about. And these mechanisms have come from law, by the way. They've been passed in parliament. There are rules for it. But there is also the other set of social civic uh, mechanisms, which Sangeeta spoke about, uh, which is about how do we uh, create greater awareness? How do we create more conversations? How do we engage in this with greater the nuance. Uh, for example, I just want to say one thing here. Many people, you know, when they talk about sexual harassment, they talk about it like it's murder, like a murder investigation or even a rape investigation. Sexual harassment is that very difficult space. You get a lewd message from somebody. That's harassment. Uh, so, and, and uncalled for touch. That's harassment. Now, so when you investigate something like this, even the nature of investigation changes. I think those who throw these lines in social media must understand that the nature of investigation itself is far more complex, far more sensitive, far more um, understanding of the larger space occupied by the individual and of maybe other cases that come up. So this, when I talk about social mechanisms, I'm talking about both awareness, safe spaces, um, uh, creating uh, resources, all that at the same time trying to make these ICC functional, which means some honesty and integrity among the community members to tr truly do something about it. Okay, and there's another question, um, quite an important one. How do we deal with false allegations or the possibility of false allegations? Uh, Davina, sh should I come to you on that? 
one cannot say that there won't be any false allegations but i I'd, i'd like to say that in my opinion judging by my experience i don't think i mean the whole process of uh, making a charge and uh, going through with it facing condemnation losing concerts losing career opportunities getting marked for life in some cases it's not pleasant at all i i don't i don't uh, agree i don't think that these cases would be made up by and large but i'm not saying that there won't be some cases by and, large, and i've often heard people say uh by and large they would not be but what is the due process that needs to be followed um to you know uh, before you say decide to take away concerts from somebody as i as i said as a as an organizer I, I, and as a civil society member and as a civil society member i believe that such cases would be very very minuscule and that my general principle would be to go with uh, the uh, you know to to believe what is being alleged at least prima facie and i'm hoping that yes there should be institutional laws systems all of that falling into place to establish the truth but like krishna also said like swarna also said establishing the truth is is notoriously difficult in a space like this and that is where the problem arises especially when you don't have robust social environment where you don't have proactive systems and individuals playing their roles the checks and balances in in a in a society so um I I I mean I've often heard people say that uh, you know a lot of these women are in consensual relationships in my experience the consensual relationship always boomerangs and is is uh, you know is is bad for the women involved I don't see the 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 popular star uh, aging a day or losing anything if it's consensual how is it that the women uh, you are part of this so called consensual arrangement are the ones who don't do very well their their uh, so if at all that was part of their uh, agenda their attempt to get career uh, trade offs don't really work out their marriages get broken their relationships go uh, you know south it's it's so i don't i i'm not sure that i agree with the severity of that claim and like i said we should all be guided by rules systems institutions and i'm hoping that that will weed out uh, whatever few aberrations that there are so the artists against sexual harassment anywhere anytime asha an organization has collected nearly 300 signatures on this statement uh, this is a message that we've got coming in which is asking for implementation of uh, the sexual harassment act sensitization training for musicians teachers and others in the industry and barring musicians accused of sexual abuse from performing unless exonerated by a competent legal authority i know tm krishna you wanted to come in here so i just want to say one thing you know about this this whole bogus notion that there'll be so many complaints that are these women are purposely going to be targeting men you know this is this huge smoke screen that um, patriarchy is throwing at us uh, and i want to say something when in 2018 uh, all the allegations came out for 3 weeks there was an twitter account which had allegations against me for 3 weeks so they kept putting on tweets saying all kinds of things for 3 weeks i didn't do anything i spoke to my lawyer and i i basically waited to see so i just want to say and that that allegation just this is dissipated that account doesn't exist anymore so i just want to say what are these men scared of and if there is an allegation come out there and you need to be investigated very simple as that and we have we have enough cases to show that when false allegations came they finally fall break down they don't add up so let's stop throwing this this bogey on everybody this is a big bogey here i just say very quickly that we do uh, workshops and sessions on all forms of gender based violence and this is actually a question that comes up every single time um the question of false allegation uh, allegations 
the thing is that it is really difficult to make an allegation the opportunity cost of speaking out about sexual or gender based violence that you've experienced is so high in patriarchal society that the possibility the probability that somebody will maliciously or frivolously make a complaint against another person is actually fairly small um and yes that small percentage is unfair but you know there are also people who don't observe traffic laws there are people who commit murders regardless of laws against murder you know all laws are abused and violated so why is it that we are particularly sensitive to the creation of norms and regulations around sexual and gender based violence Yes, there's a comment from uh, Kritika Dir Gangi uh, who says uh, the Indian classical music world cannot grow if we keep it separate from the issues of society. There's a tendency of gurus to say that we don't need to care about worldly issues. Music is our only concern. It's incorporated from a very early age. Um, and uh, the uh, another suggestion for a solution is from Alexandra Templier. Maybe content can remain available. but artists take uh, artists taken away and their royalties taken away um and arshia sethi actually has a question for sandeep mr virdi it doesn't matter what happened in the past we are concerned about what happens in the future so is it a yes or no about molesters in your festivals it's one word to tell us where we stand um i don't know by where we stand i don't know whether she means people who have done the accusing or people who have been accused i i i don't understand from that um so i i think um she's uh, my my uh, my understanding is that her she's saying that your argument that it's it's complicated isn't sufficient for her do you have a response well the the answer is actually very simple charu we would never give a platform to any person who has any uh record of harassment or sexual abuse so if if we if it's a known uh situation about an artist we would not feature them and in fact i've gone further and said that we have a block list which is we which we maintain of artists that we have triangulated information about through various sources and we will not invite them to the festival no matter what they are or what status they are whether they are a legend whether they are a great master whatever their position is we will not invite them to the festival so i hope that is really really clear um one one more question we've got just 5 minutes left um uh, there's actually standing with truth slash me to dhrupad sansthan saying one more issue is that gurus and senior students still engage in uh, engaged in sexual abuses this is an allegation i have to say that uh, there have been denials um, right as we discuss these topics is what this person is saying is there any possibility that some kind of body is created which creates a warning system to such people to say we have been watching you um uh, sangeeta ji you haven't spoken for a long time is that one you want to take or anybody else uh maybe the maybe yeah <clears throat> devina <coughs> because about the hindustani system um a body yes but uh, again i like i said there there is a need for all thinking people who are concerned about the state of this ecosystem and its future to come together and address these issues so yes how exactly those uh, you know the bodies would work or what their mandates would be i i understand that this would be what they're talking about is a purely civil society uh, initiative and not uh, right swarna it can't have a legal uh, obviously it can't exist within the uh, framework of the laws in any way it would have to be a civil society effort and i think that should be possible but uh, for that we need to come together we need to acknowledge that these are serious critical issues and that they harm the music they harm the future of musicians and they uh, keep audiences away 
Can I just add something? Um, for go on, Cindy. So I think what uh, Krishna ji said about the men, what is it? Is, is because it is a patriarchal society. We live in a culture which is based around two, two main things, sharam, which is shame, and izzat, which is honor. I would say that both individuals and organizations may have been complicit in silencing alleged perpetrators of abuse to avoid the Indian culture of shame and honor. There is a lot of people saying it's happened in the past, so let's not think about it. But I think there is something more, which is the cult of the maestro. That is a really, really big problem within the Indian classical tradition. Often men have thrived because they yield great power and privilege because they are perceived to be artistically brilliant. In any other form, they would be held to account. Maestros believe that they are above the normal standards of behavior and act with impunity because they know they can get away with it. In the Indian music sector, and this is something we only have that, uh, legends. Mm -hmm. We only have a number of Go legends on, yeah. both north and south. And for the corporates that fund them, this becomes the only commercial viability to set out their festivals. So what you have is you have a legend or a big master who's brilliant, and then you have the commercial people who come out to sell concerts. Now in the West, you have uh, Placinda Domingo, who's a global opera star, whose ability to sell out a major London venue meant that the venue itself, no matter, even if they had 20 women who had accused him of harassment, they did not withdraw the concert. So then he only pulled himself out 24 hours before the concert. So you have this situation. In addition to this, you also have unequal power, di power dynamics, which has been mentioned before, but there's also other issues around caste, the wealth of the student, the student wanting to have a career to support one's family. And I think there's another thing about the cult of the maestro is that they are generally given the final say on who is hired and who is not, re who's rehired again mm. in the future. Yes, um, uh, just on Placida Domingo, I don't think there was ever a conviction, but you're right, he pulled himself out of the concert himself, uh, and he's denied the, the allegations. Um, TM Krishna, very briefly, because uh, we have to sum up uh, within uh, three minutes. I had, Sangeeta had something to say, I think. I think. Yeah, yeah, I just want quickly, I just want to add one more thing to what Sandeep Ji said, that in the Carnatic music tradition, there's one more thing which is also perceived, the, the, uh, which is the divine. So, you know, uh, since Carnatic music is so entrenched, in the, the lyrics of the songs are all entrenched in the uh, bhakti, as they say. So it's almost as though the musicians are also you know, God. So this, this is a, another huge excuse for them to get away with what they do. It's, it all points to a, a huge power balance. I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, uh, it's not just that there's a power imbalance between humans, but we are talking about people who are considered, you know, godlike figures. Uh, so yes, uh, that can be terrible. Um, so um, in terms of solutions, of course, uh, people have said, uh, acknowledge that these are serious issues and that will keep audiences away. Uh, women need safe spaces, women mainly, but they're men as well uh, in some cases uh, who have been harassed. Um, abolishing the Guru Shishya tradition. Um, smaller federations, perhaps a cooperative system of peer support. Training on sexual harassment. Um, moral clauses in contracts, so contracts firstly, and then moral clauses in the contracts. Um, Darbar has mentioned safeguarding and risk assessment and workshops on gender-based violence. Uh, those are the solutions. Um, I think there's a lot to think about over there, but uh, at least we've arrived at, you know, some idea of uh, what could be done instead of only discussing uh, what's happened and what the broad issues are. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank very much uh, Swarna Rajagopalan, Sangeeta Shivakumar, T.M. Krishna, Davina Dutt, uh, Shuha Murgal in absentia, and uh, Sandeep Virdi for being here with us on Darbar's uh, session, Women in Music, uh, with a focus on Me Too in Indian classical music and dance. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.